So uh, a while ago, uh, I recorded uh, a statement of faith for myself, uh, and then due to the deletion of an entire YouTube channel account from Google for reasons I know not what, um, I'm re-recording some videos. Uh, in the interim, uh, something happened which is relevant to this video, which is uh, I had written a piece of which my statement of faith was a part uh, that I expected to be published in the New York yearly meeting uh, newsletter. The yearly meeting for within the Religious Society of Friends in Friends General Conference is like a conference size for the Methodist or like kind of a large presbytery for the Presbyterians. That's the kind of size. It's made up of, I think, 96 different congregations. So it's a newsletter that was going out and I had written a piece, I'd been asked to write a piece for it. And then that thing happens, which sometimes happens, where you write something and then they don't have room for it. Um, and so uh, they put it on the website. But my hunch is that not many people go to the website when at the bottom it says, oh yeah, if you want other things, go here. Uh, probably the majority of the folks just read what's on the paper that they get because the newspaper is still um, made out of, in fact, newspaper. Um, anyway, so I thought, given the content of it, um, that I would make a video because uh, I was asked to write about um, the future of the Religious Society of Friends. Particularly, I imagined, um, the, the stream or the branch of the Religious Society of Friends of Quakerism that I'm part, which is the unprogrammed liberal branch, sometimes known as Friends General Conference, um, the unprogrammed um, liberal friends. So um, I'm going to uh, read uh, slash probably impromptuized uh, a little bit here and there that article that I wrote um, for Spark of New York Yearly Meeting and uh, put it on the web so that friends can see it uh, in its entirety and hear and see me doing it. So uh, without further ado, um, the future of the Religious Society of Friends, yeah, as I think. So I had been sitting for weeks um, with the question when it was posed to me in a request to write for the issue. How do you envision the future of the faith of the Religious Society of Friends? Over and over then, in trying to sit with the future, I was driven back towards the present. How are we to get there, wh wherever it is that there might be, if we don't even know where here is? What is our tradition about? What is at its core? Why do we worship? I found myself scarcely able to imagine the future, given that I had a hard time even grasping the present. It's not that I haven't considered these questions, far from it. It's that I am unclear that my responses to these questions would be anywhere near to normative. And when I had that thought, that's when way opened. The way forward is not in there being some kind of normative Quaker response to those questions, but in having some vocal response and dialogue. In our meetings and homes, we ought to really be asking these questions and expecting responses from one another and ourselves. Why do we come to worship? Do we really believe in discernment? By what authority? Do we even believe in God? And what do we even mean by God? Can we unite with our faith and practice? And if not, then what? We are all doing each other a great disservice, I think, by not having conversations about these questions out in the open. Contemporarily, we liberal friends tend to resist articulating our beliefs. All are welcome, we say, and none are turned away. And with this, I do unite. But what happens? What happens when someone comes through our door because she wants to know what we believe? What happens when someone believes something and isn't sure they're welcome to even believe it for a lack of conversation and knowing what fits in there? My hope for the future of our tradition is not one in which we all agree, but one in which we are impelled into the transformation of inner and outer lives, conceived, nurtured, and pruned in discerning worship, the result of which ripens into justice and the fruits of the Spirit. My hope for the future of our tradition is that we might then be empowered and encouraged to speak regularly and profoundly of our experiences of the divine. And towards that broader vision, I offer my perspective and my faith in hopes that you will then offer yours in a video, blog, or a letter. 
This is how truth prospers with me. This. I am in agreement with Patrick Nugent when he writes that whenever goodness radiates and transforms the heart, whenever the conscience rises up and stands in that revealing and liberating light of goodness there, whether named or not, is the bread of life which never fades away, the redeeming presence of the risen and living Christ. I unite with that, and I stand with him and our forebears in the belief that the practice of a full and authentic Christianity is one grounded in the experiences of real presence, mediated via the gift of the Holy Spirit, and actually discernible in worship. My faith's power is not in the mere ethic of compassion, an eternity of heavenly compensation at some later time, or the warm glow of community life in the present. It's not just those things. My work is to practice coming into that light, life, and power which takes away the occasion of all war. The presence of God in which we are perfected, if only for a moment, and in which we can enter the kingdom of heaven and perceive, even if just a slice of it, the path is to live lives that more and more readily resemble those moments revealed in prophetic ministry. To realize that we need not build up the kingdom because the kingdom is already here among us, if only we would enter it. I believe that much of contemporary progressive Christianity, including our own religious society, has become too close a bedfellow to generic liberal social concern and has turned too often to rationalism and modernity for its identity, becoming habituated to a pattern of accepting a series of second bests instead of waiting on the liberating power of God which insists upon justice in the present and asks us to conform our lives to that. I know that most of and much of the history and narrative of this Christian tradition of ours is dubious. And to be frank, it's hard to swallow. I know this, and yet I know that there is no nourishment in the desert of doubt. I believe that the French theologian and philosopher Paul Ricoeur was correct when he wrote that we are called beyond the desert of criticism to a second naivete. Yes. There are times when it's best we not eat, for there's a sickness to be purged. But we must acknowledge that hunger cannot be fed with starvation. Eventually there comes a time when we are to take up knowledge and precision, all gained through the wielding of our hermeneutic of suspicion, and step with it out beyond the edge of doubt, back into a place of surrendering belief. Not as naive children, but as people of faith, working on the basis of the substance of things hoped for but as yet unseen, trusting that in our faithfulness we will be led towards justice, granted compassion, and met with community. By virtue of our baptism in the Spirit, we are called to this. We are called to belief. And so, I believe in the resurrection of the body. As people of God, we are called into a new life, into a new way of living on the earth, while still in our flesh and with our feet still yet made of clay. I believe that the story and hope of this new birth were with Jesus in his life and death. And I believe that in his refusal to submit to the powers and principalities, he offered even them the opportunity for redemption. We, then, are called to do no less. I believe these things because they are what seem most right to me in those moments when I have been held under the holy power of God's Spirit poured out. And yet, even as I have been held in that power, I feel called to resist the temptation to allow my sense of certainty to reign above my hospitality. To resist placing my sense of truth over and above others. I do feel called to proclaim my testimony as exactly that. It is a concrete witness as to the experience of God's transforming capacity in my life and my flesh and not some idealized and absolute external theology or creed. I believe that the living water is yet live and that we are each invited to drink at that place of nourishment there beyond the desert, wherein we might also partake of the bread and enter the kingdom, for it is already here among us, if only we would enter enter and share the story of the land beyond. We gain so much from hearing one another speak from those hallowed places. 
So I pray that we let our lives speak. What is your experience? And where are we now? And where will we be in the future?